Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Primal Blueprint Podcast. I am honored today to interview Dr. John Gray. He is the author of the most well-known and trusted relationship book of all time, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. If you haven't heard of it, you are living on another planet. He also has uh, his latest is uh, Beyond Mars and Venus, Relationship Skills for Today's Complex World. We're going to get into a whole ton of wonderful, juicy topics here. USA Today listed his book, as the most uh, one of the top 10 most influential books of the last quarter century. Oh my gosh, there's so much more to go and we'll put the full bio in the show notes. But um, you know, I think here's the thing. I think a lot of people know your work for people that don't, but I really want to jump into it. If we could just talk about that original Mars versus Venus. Um, can you give us like the top three things that like women, you need to know this, you're not getting it over here. And hey, men, you're not getting it over here. And then I want to get into some other deeper, deeper tangents of these topics. Well, you know, a lot of the ideas of that book, because, you know, it's over 100 million people have read the book, have become almost cliches today. But women, you got to realize men are different. They need time to be close and time to pull away. That's called space. That's called cave time. Man cave is essential for men. That idea, it was in Men Are From Mars. It's uh, updated and beyond Mars and Venus in terms of hormones. When a man connects with a woman and his family and the people he cares about, he's making testosterone, but he makes more estrogen. And estrogen is a female hormone that lowers his testosterone. So he becomes more dependent on her for love, affection, understanding, and so forth. He needs to back, back off back to being independent. So independence creates male hormones, interdependence and even needing and dependence produces female hormones. So guys, you got to understand that for women to make estrogen, they're way over on their male side these days. You can bring them back to their female side. And the most powerful way to do that is listening, asking questions. Now that's kind of it's actually the most masculine thing you can do is to focus in on somebody. Don't think about yourself, but try to go into her. I mean, really what we do in sex is we go into her and that increases testosterone. If you just listen without trying to fix, men always want to try to fix her or solve the problem or make her feel better by telling her she shouldn't feel what she feels. And that's the big mistake. See, we want to put on our Mr. Fix-It hat you're unhappy, honey, don't think like that, or that's not a big deal, or why are you talking so long? Just forget it. These are mechanisms that men do for themselves that don't work if you say to her. And he doesn't know that. He doesn't recognize another big difference is that when it comes to emotions, women experience a stronger emotional response to little problems. Men experience a stronger emotional response to bigger problems. So when she has a strong emotional response, he often thinks she's saying it's a big problem and then he overreacts to her. So ironically, when men think women are overacting, it's actually he who's overreacting to her, not understanding where she's coming from. Another one of the bottom line things women is to realize men behave best when their testosterone levels go up. What increases testosterone is when he feels acknowledged and appreciated. If he does something, your smile makes the biggest difference in the world. Uh, your eyebrows go up, you're happy to see him. Even for a moment, it makes a huge difference to create a surge of testosterone when he reconnects with you. You have no idea the impact a woman's positive reaction has on a man's levels of testosterone. A man has no idea of how powerful it is by showing acts, behaviors of consideration and concern shifts in your attention, your behavior, just walking into the room instead of just going right to the TV set, acknowledging her, maybe even stroking her hair, looking at her face. What are you doing? Just a little attention. Attention is highly, highly significant to stimulate female hormones. Ultimately, when women's female hormones go down and their male hormones go up, their stress level goes up. For men, when their estrogen levels go up, their testosterone goes down, their stress levels go up. So we wanna stay out of the stress zones, keep our hearts open, and that's how we can grow in love. So those are some of the basics. Men go to their cave, women need to talk. Men don't try to interrupt her, ask questions, three questions. Help me understand that better, tell me more, what else? Because men don't know what to do, they wanna give you solutions all the time. Show interest, it actually has a big effect for women. Now for women, when men are talking, don't show that much interest. Don't ask so many questions. Just load down the questions, but instead make acknowledgement like, what a good idea, or that makes sense, or you're right. 
Now, certainly you might be thinking that, say it out loud. That's the key, is whenever possible, and it's authentic. But authenticity is the key. The last thing is authenticity is the key. That doesn't mean share everything you feel. It's time and place. Often when a woman is wanting a change to take place, she complains. Anytime you complain to a man, it pushes his testosterone down. It's a source of stress for him. And the way men cope with stress is to forget it. So you wonder why men are always forgetting things. That's how they, for, that's how they cope with stress. You know, it's funny because, so I used to write sketch comedy and perform it on a regular basis. And one of the, we would, we would realize through audiences over time, what jokes and certain things don't work. And one of the things that never flies is when a woman is like yelling in a scene, but it's okay. And it can be very funny if a guy is like, what the hell is going on here? But if a woman does it, we all have that social construction of like, oh my God, nag the naggy, the naggy woman, right? And it, it never works and it seems unfair, but that's the way it goes. And, you know, like you said, over time, you, you, men need to be appreciated and women need to feel heard. I think it's interesting when we talk about these hormones and I love this discussion, the way that you break it down. So if women are unhappy, that estrogen goes down. And if men are stressed, right, their testosterone goes down. Yes. Now, and then we'll get into some of the sexual aspects of this because I find your opinion on that fascinating. Can you talk a, a bit about, you know, you mentioned that like half of the men growing up in our country do not have a father present. Let's talk about some of the pitfalls and things that have led to maybe, mm, you know, not, not being in our own primal nature as much as we probably should be. Well, we're living in a society right now that doesn't really acknowledge the power and the goodness of masculinity. And, and maybe it's well-deserved in some situations without a doubt. But ultimately, masculinity is the part of all of us which is independent and willing to sacrifice ourselves happily for others. It's the servant. It's serving others. Think of the soldier who goes into battle knowing he may die, but he's doing it for a noble cause. That's his testosterone production, and that's what masculinity is about. And you know when it comes to the army and those types of things, they always had parades. They always had statues. You know, this was a way of acknowledging that sacrifice that men make. And if we look historically, we see that where men did behave properly, it was doing difficult, dangerous, dirty jobs. You know, today, construction workers out there with the jackhammer, you know, doing the dangerous things. Men are actually much better suited for that because it produces testosterone. I'm not saying women can't do it. There's no rules here that I'm saying, but I'm saying that when it comes to hormonal balance, when a man feels I'm doing something dangerous, and, but I'm good at it, he has to be trained, so I'm confident and I can do it, testosterone levels soar. Then he just needs his reward and he's functional. So much of dysfunction in the past, and there is a lot of dysfunction on both sides in our past, is when men don't get rewarded properly. And we're still that way. You know, society really doesn't pay men their worth when they're doing these basic, basic jobs. I think maybe that's starting to change now as we have essential workers, we're recognizing essential means to get more money. But having said that, that's men behave best when they feel acknowledged and appreciated for what they do. And being a man myself, knowing that there was a lot of pressure growing up thinking I had to make enough money to support a woman. See, the world's different now. That pressure is actually very good on men if they have the training and the opportunity. So, you know, I'm a privileged male. I'm white. I went to a university. So it wasn't such a big stress for me because there were opportunities for me. And back to the thing about the father is I had a father role model. This, that we, Warren Farrell and I wrote a whole book called Boy Crisis, where we talked about the real research showing what happens to boys when they're not exposed to a role, a male, mo a role male, a role model that's male, a father, someone they can identify with, self-identification with someone that a woman thinks is wonderful. So it's not just having a father, it's a father whose wife thinks he's wonderful. That builds a boy's self-esteem and that raises his testosterone. And in, there's a reality today and there's other causes as well that the male population, the testosterone levels have significantly dropped. Uh, many people say, well, maybe that's a natural evolutionary feature. And I'd say, no, it's not because I'm a very evolved male. I've, a, you know, I've got 27 books, bestsellers. I've got a happy marriage for 34 years, children, grandchildren, a house, the whole thing, the whole package. I meditate, I'm spiritual. You know, I've, I've, I was opportunity to have great mentors in my life and opportunities that most people don't get. Having said all that, at 69 years old, my testosterone levels are higher than they were as a young man. 
testosterone can go higher and higher and higher for men. My sex life is way beyond anything I experienced as a younger man because I've learned how to build my testosterone. And I'm high educated. That's why I write these books to try to educate people on the mindsets and the behaviors and the healthy diet and the exercise and the relaxation and the sex. All of these things are important to be a whole person. So I put myself out there, not just as an expert because I read it in books, I live it and I teach it. And what I know, so I speak with confidence about things that nobody really can talk about is that this low testosterone is not an evolutionary factor. It's a setback. It's a correction. We're going in the wrong direction. And evolution does that where we tend to go in the wrong direction and self-correct and then self-correct and self-correct. And so one of the symptoms we're seeing for males is this low testosterone, inability to sustain a commitment with a woman. That means is unable to maintain attraction to a woman. When you are hungry to have sex with your partner and you're a man, you will stay committed to her for a lifetime. But that takes high testosterone. It takes sexual uh, discipline. You have to understand sexual energy. You also have to understand love energy to have a partner who's willing to be open to you and continue to respond to you the way she did when she was a younger woman. Before Now, you have some really interesting breakdowns with body types and testosterone and, and different types of orgasms and how that may or may not affect women and weight loss and some really interesting stuff I want to get into. Before we do, I just want to hear your your sermon on, uh, on this, which is, so I am obviously an alpha female. And when I went into the workforce and when I speak with other alpha females over time, in hindsight, we look back and as you would guess, we realize that this was a problem for us. First of all, the first problem is, is sometimes we would go for beta males, which then we'd get tired of because then we're carrying on the whole taking care of, you know, mothering thing. Yes, and then the other thing, <laughs> right. And then the losing other thing, attraction. right. You lose the attraction you lose the respect because it's not primal nature for the man not to take charge and be this guy. And, um, you know, and then they get barreled over and that's the worst thing in the world. I mean, I think one of the most painful things for me to see is when I see a woman emasculate a man and he does nothing about it. Uh, both, both are wrong and it, it kills me. Um, but then we also notice over time that like one of the things that a lot of alpha females have to really work on and which I had to as well, which is right. Relaxing into the feminine, getting into the vulnerability to be able to have that polarization with an alpha, because that often is a, a better choice for someone like me. Can we talk about those dynamics a bit? Because I know you have so much probably to say on, on this. There's a lot to, to say on that. And I won't mention more detail. It's it complicated, can be complicated. I'm going to simplify it. In Beyond Mars and Venus, I go really into those hormonal differences. So let me simplify one thing. When you're alpha, that means you're you're more on your male side and you can be born that way, okay? There's nothing wrong with that, which means that because if you've got ovaries, your job also for your healthy body is to be able to produce enough hormones to make a baby, at least till you go to menopause, okay? If you can't make a baby, meaning you're not making enough estrogen, then your body's gonna be out of balance. It's gonna say, hey, uh, something's wrong here. And we know now that when women have, uh, if they're having PMS, they're having hormonal imbalance. If they're not able to have orgasm, they're having hormonal imbalance. So what can a man do? You can actually make, uh, in a sense, if you're an alpha woman, you can make a beta man into an alpha, just to let you know that. Uh, it, it may be that the best suited man for you when you look at material success is a beta. Uh, you know, I'm an alpha. How, how is that? Where, 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 where are you getting that from? What's, what's that? I'm, I'm explaining this to you. I mean, I'm going to get there, which is if, if you want to, I have a friend, she's a, she's an alpha woman. She's so successful. She's so busy all the time. And she keeps saying, I want a man like you, John, who's an alpha. I said, then you wouldn't be able to do what you want to do. You see, I need a support system. There has to be kind of this balance. If you want to be out there in the world and doing your thing, you don't want to have some other guy being out there in the world doing his thing as much as you because you have to have some sort of contrast in a relationship. So, but what, what way you make a beta man into an alpha is they're actually more capable of becoming more receptive, not receptive, penetrating your feelings. You see, when we shifted from this dynamic of women are dependent on men to survive and be secure, then suddenly you, you shift into a place where you have choice and you have your own biological destiny as well as a woman, your primary needs now become your emotional fulfillment. So being alpha is part of your emotional fulfillment. That's your male side emotional fulfillment. So you actually could benefit by having a man who's really skilled at being attentive to you, at not competing with you, 
at being understanding of you, of being interested in your feelings, of being romantic with you, of being creative in that romantic world. You know, a lot of these guys who are alphas, they have no time, no energy to even think about being romantic. Uh, they also have a greater tendency to just discount emotional feelings. You're both on this alpha side that says no big deal, no problem, no handle it. You need permission where somebody's more in touch with their feelings where they cannot express their feelings. That's the problem with beta men is they express their feelings. They're so sensitive. He has to learn. You have to learn to just say, I don't want to hear your, in, in essence, this is not about you. This is about me. I just want you to hear me and be really selfish about your vulnerability and be able to go into a place where you really look a little crazy, you look a little weak, you're a little insecure, you're doubting yourself, and you're not gonna have some alpha guy going, ah, ridiculous, throw that away, who cares about that? So there's a contrast that you have. So his masculinity can show up in many different ways. One of the most powerful testosterone stimulators, whether you're an alpha man or a beta man, and I think all men have the potential to be alpha, they just look different, is being a good listener. Now, if you were to say to most guys, oh, you're such a good listener, they go, what? That's nothing. No, he doesn't recognize that if you actually can penetrate into a woman to where she feels anger, she feels hurt, she feels fear, she feels insecurity, she feels doubt, she feels mistrust, and he doesn't get upset with you, that's Superman. See, that's the man. You see, when you're looking at primal man, he does, nobody bothers him. He doesn't get hurt by anything, but he has no empathy or compassion for your hurt because nothing hurts him. You can't feel empathy and compassion for someone if you've never felt something like that. Good point. Yeah, so what you got is more the beta guys are more sensitive. They have to be trained to be tough. It doesn't mean they have to change their nature because some people's nature is not to say, hey, look at me. I'm the richest guy. I can accomplish. I can achieve. I'm ambitious. Some guys are like, hey, I'm happy to follow the leader. But they're still men, you know, in the army, you got your general out there, you got your commanders, but you got those soldiers, they're tough guys, but they're following. So there, there's a whole distinction of, you know, when you said primal man, you know, the man who's out there doing this thing, that, that's one aspect of the primal man. You know, what you want is a primal man who's able to be unmoved by your complaints, unmoved by your upsets, and completely focused on you when you want that attention and go slow and attentive in sex. And ultimately, this super primal man doesn't have an ejaculation until you've had five orgasms. See, that's what you really want, is a man who has staying power. That's power. I mean, Matt, Steve, most guys, oh, I shouldn't say this again. Most guys aren't trained how to do that, I'll put it that way. And therefore, women don't know their full sexual potential because they don't have a guy who can be present with a hard erection long enough for her to go to one layer of orgasm to another, to another, to another, and last long enough. And, you know, that draws up all kinds of illusions. You know, what does it mean? There's techniques to do this, but you can't do it if you're a male, if you don't have the techniques. I don't want to just throw that out there like women and go, hey, why can't you last longer in sex? There's a whole dance that goes male, female, back and forth with this. Yeah, and I guess that brings me to your interesting uh, way of looking at, you talked about, and let's get into both sexes, but you talked about like certain job categories and, and certain testosterone with men in terms of body types. And then you went into talking about how, like, for example, if a woman is just self-pleasuring, let's say through the clitoris, that that could actually help her hold on to weight and be affecting the adrenals in a negative way. <clears throat> I thought that was one of the most interesting thing you said. Can you unpack these okay. things for us? Most of what I've just said and everything I say has actually Western science backing it up. That's Taoist science. That's a Taoism philosophy. Okay, what they explain is the different points on a woman's body, just like acupuncture. There's different arousal points. Those arousal points need to be aroused and stimulated and stimulated. And then uh, there's four basic main points in her vagina that need to be stimulated as her arousal increases and increases. If she focuses all of her sexual energy on the clitoris, which is one arousal point that goes to your kidneys and adrenal gland. So if all your sexual energy is going to your adrenal gland and kidneys for your orgasms, you're not getting orgasms in all the other points, then it's too much focus in one area that causes water retention. Okay, your kidneys become weak. So they call that weak kidney energy and you start to retain water and that can cause weight gain in many women. And you'll see this in a lot of lesbians uh, where they gain this, they just keep building up this weight, you know, in their thighs and their hips and so forth. 
and they just can't get rid of it. Uh, and that's because mainly they're just doing, mainly they're doing clitoral stimulation. That's really fascinating. And, um, you know, and back to the way you, you talked about how, you know, men will start to feel like controlled in a certain way, depending on our approach. Can you talk about this whole little like entry, these five words? Hey, it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just said it. I mean, uh, let me, I'll do, uh, that's the magic, fr- that's the million dollar phrase. Okay. So let, let me give you, if you want to change a man, first of all, you, you always want to tell him, look, don't step on my feet. So how do you tell somebody don't step on my feet? Now, if both your heart is open and you're both feeling loved and supported, you say, hey, don't step on my feet. Your partner says, fine. But if your partner's heart isn't open or your heart isn't open and you're like resenting something, anything you say is going to be really trigger defensiveness in him. That tendency to want to change your partner to make you happy. See, we should look to our partner ideally to make you happier. I'm happy. And if you did this, it'd make me happier. But hey, if you don't do that, I'm still a happy person. So you you can't make your happiness in a relationship dependent on your partner. Otherwise, when you're asking them to change, it's a command, it's a demand. It's saying basically, if you don't stop doing that, I can't be happy around you, that you, or I can't love you. Okay, because when men, men men feel love when you're happy with them, by the way. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) how do you know he loves you? It's the kiss, and how do you know she loves you? It's her smile and her willingness to kiss, okay? So it's the delight that love gets translated. So I did something for you. So now you're not happy. I failed. So that's a, a, you know, knocks his testosterone down. He will get defensive. It's just, that's a stress reaction. Whenever we go into stress reactions, another part of our brain takes over, which is defense reaction to justify, to complain, to blame. We all have different conditioned responses based upon our childhood, our parents, their parents, their parents, their parents, their parents, back to monkeys. You know, if a, Here's a simple thing about where so much of our bad behavior comes from. Imagine you're two monkeys and you can't communicate and you keep stepping on my foot. And I say, stop, stop. And you just think it's funny because nobody's ever stepped on your foot. You don't know it's painful. How's the only way I can communicate to you that that's painful? I have to step on your foot. And that's the basis of all our craziness is getting back at people, punishing people, withholding from people, criticizing people, making them feel bad. These are automatic reactions. It's very little we can do about it except stop, 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 stop. And then you have to have an alternative that you learn will actually work. So this is an alternative that works. Now, I'm going to do the whole step process. Oh, you're stepping on my foot. So you want to tell them, you say, you know, the other day, you'd be very objective, very short. I just want to talk for a few minutes. That's already going to lower his stress level. If a woman says we need to talk, (laughs) already his stress level's up. So, but you say, hey, let's just take some time to talk. Talk, oh no, what do we have to talk about? Always men think the worst when that happens. Okay, so next thing, so you lower it. Uh, We try to have an even tone of voice, just need to talk about something. It's only gonna take a few minutes and it's not a big deal. If you say to a man, it's not a big deal, he'll make it a big deal. If you use your emotions to knock it up to a big deal, he has to push it down to it's not a big deal. This is just how life is. If you just go, and the way the monkey does it, the way monkeys do it, if I want you to change and you didn't change and I've told you twice, I have to be more upset about it. I have to show you how important this is as opposed to saying, you know, this is kind of important to me, but it's not such a big deal. Okay, it's not a big deal. Men will actually listen. And that's the most important thing you need as a woman is to actually feel, to make estrogen, Maybe not to have a clean house, but the most important thing to be happy is estrogen and somebody hears you, actually heartfelt hearing. So it's not a big deal. And then before you say anything which you want him to change, you compliment him. Now you appreciate him. I just want you to know, so my wife, when, when she started doing this, I learned this. She said, I just want you to know, I've seen how you do turn the lights out in the living room a lot, but sometimes you still forget. You see how she just minimized it? The old days, she'd say, oh, John, you always leave the lights on. Anytime you do it, always leave on. Oh, back. The man will go right into defense. No, I don't always do it. I remember I did the right way, the right way. So, so you prevent any defensive reaction by first complimenting. So it only take a few minutes. It's not a big deal. I really appreciate you do this and this and this. And sometimes you do this, and this is how it makes me feel. So you want to be able to share feelings because that's really an estrogen stimulator if you, if you feel you're going to be heard. And this is how it makes me feel. And if you say, if ever you get into the feeling place of anger or hurt 
or it really hurts me, or I feel like you don't love me, or it's not, and you need to be able to go to that place, then you need to shift and you need to go. And it reminds me of when I was a little girl. If you do that, a man will go, oh, yeah, I can see that your childhood stuff. And he'll be like your father then. He'll be like right there empathetic to you. And you can express all the feelings you want, but in a different time zone. Or it reminds me in the past when this used to happen. And so all these feelings are coming up. See, that's what a good therapist does. You know, a good therapist basically always helps a part. Well, I'm a good therapist in my opinion. And what you do is you help people understand what they feel now and then let them realize that this is linked to something in the past. And when it's linked to something in the past, then in the present time, it's no longer just about the present, is it? So it's an overreaction, but it's still valid. You wanna validate, but recognize that all of our upsets in relationships are overreactions. But you put it in a context where it's still valid. You know, this hurts my feelings. It brings up all this insecurity. I feel like I don't even want to cook for you anymore. I don't want to, I don't know where you, where you were. I feel like you're dead. You know, whatever your fears are, upsets, be vulnerable. And, and then you create a history in your relationship where your partner knows you will always take responsibility for it. This triggers feelings inside of me. So I'd appreciate it if sometimes you try to remember to call me or if you would open up the turn off the window, uh, uh, turn out the lights or, or uh, take me out on more dates and whatever, just make me feel so much happier. Do you see how we just went through this whole thing? Not that you have to do that every time, but that's the bigger picture. You know, this is like mastery in a relationship. And then I know some women who are bitter and they say, well, I don't have to walk on eggshells like that. And I go, you know, you don't have to walk on eggshells if your heart is open. But if you're resenting your partner and you have any bitterness, you need to practice doing that and it will soften you. I do this whenever I ask my partner to make changes and I love doing it. It's like feeling I have the power to get whatever I want using love, not manipulation. It's a wonderful, wonderful power that we can have to be in a love place rather than a place of you're not listening to me, you're defending me, you're not hearing how I feel, don't you listen to what I feel, aren't I important to you, you just don't love me. These are all just childlike reactions inside because we don't know how to be uh, confident and capable in our relationships. Yeah, it's a lot of pointing fingers. Now, I don't remember when I read the statistic, it could have been like 15, 20 years ago, and I don't know if it's right, but it seems to me that it would be somewhat correct, which is, and again, could be wrong here, but it was. I think I read something like, 80% of the success of a romantic relationship is the sexual connection and the, the that, or, or is, there, is there something different about that? Because I feel that, I say this, one of the themes that kills me, I'm a very sexual person. I was raised where it was open in my family. Everybody, it was, in fact, if two people weren't having sex in the family, everybody was concerned because they knew that would be the downfall. I even remember a great quote from Hot, uh, Cat, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, right? With uh, those famous actors and, and, um, the couple, Paul Newman and his wife at the time, they were having all of these horrible disagreements. And I remember they were staying at the grandmother's house. And in the movie, the grandmother walks up to the bedroom and she slams her hand on the bed. And she said, problems that start here end here. And I thought that was so great. But here's the theme I'm, I'm bummed about. If I hear one more married man brag about having sex with his wife, I'm going to jump off a bridge. Why aren't people getting what they want here? The, the guys aren't asking for it and, and, and just sticking in a sexless marriage or a sexless situation. The women aren't realizing that this is very important. And frankly, I'm just going to give my opinion on it, which is this is the marriage contract you signed. The only difference between me and you and me and my significant other is you and I aren't having sex. That's, that's the only difference. So, so if, it, if there's a sexless marriage going on, I mean, how can we improve this? Or what are some statistics or things that are around this issue? Because it, it bums me out so much. I remember doing like 20 years ago, Bill, 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 Ma Bill Mark. Bill Mark. And, and he had a feminist attacking me. And one of my things is how important sex was. And she was being a woman saying, yeah, I, we disagree with Dr. Gray. We think women want sex just as much as men. And Bill said, yeah, John and I will be happy to agree with you. That just hasn't been our experience. <laughs> you know, every I mean, woman, you know, we don't have that free. We don't have that positive approach to sexuality that you're expressing here. And, and being sex positive, there's sort of a whole movement of sex positive. Doesn't mean that you have to have sex with other people. It means you have sex with your partner, in my opinion, 
and continue to enjoy it and go to higher, higher levels of deeper and deeper intimacy. Sex positive doesn't mean, well, I just have sex with anybody. It means that sex is a big part of a relationship because what is it determines the difference between my wife? I pick my wife because I have all this great sex with her and this great sexual attraction. She picks me, by the way, because of safety and security. That's the primary thing women value is the safety and security. But when a woman feels safe, and I'm trying not to be too explicit here, but it becomes multi-orgasmic with a man, she then realizes, and I want to keep this relationship because the sex is great. See, I think women, as they grow in love and security, they realize that sex is what holds us together. And it's the most important thing, but there's a prerequisite to it. See, she needs to feel that, see, estrogen is, if a woman, uh, that, so the safety hormone is oxytocin, okay? So when a woman feels safe, oxytocin gets produced. Oxy, that's, and in sex, that's naked bodies touching each other. First of all, getting naked is you feel safe. Nobody's going to be critical of you. They're going to see you as beautiful. So there's a safety there. And you're going to reveal to someone what you don't reveal with anybody else. That means you feel more safe with them. And now you're going to reveal yourself. Oxytocin gets produced, naked bodies touching each other gently, affectionately, you know, petting each other basically and kissing each other and effect, being affectionate. That oxytocin lowers testosterone in women and raises their estrogen. When their estrogen levels start to increase, then their testosterone level will also rise back up again. So that's when a woman is ovulating, for example, her estrogen level hits a peak level. When it hits the peak level, then her testosterone level rises. And that's where she will usually feel the horniest is when their estrogen levels are the highest. She can also feel horny if she's on her male side, but she doesn't always lubricate as much because she's not on her female side needing estrogen. So the way women can pump up their testosterone, which says, I want sex, is to have a lot of estrogen so that the testosterone comes up, lowers estrogen a bit, but not too much. She still has her ovulation. So ovulation is actually super high estrogen in women and super high testosterone for her body, for her body type. For a man, his testosterone is much higher and when he ejaculates, his estrogen levels peak. And that's the problem for men today. The soft men, the beta men generally don't last long in sex. Super uh, uh, testosterone guys with very low estrogen will last a long time, but they often are not as affectionate and loving. Uh, it's sort of like this jackhammer and it's, there's no personal interaction. You know, sort of the, the porn star, you're watching him pump and there's just nothing going on. He's just got his jackhammer going. That's not satisfying. What you want is this blend of masculine and feminine energies. The problem is, is that, and, and for the men that are listening, a few techniques on this is men think you just stick it all the way in. You don't stick it all the way in. You start with the clitoris, start on the clitoris. First, you start with kissing. Say you're doing French kissing, the points haven't been aroused in the tongue to awaken the nipples and the breasts. And then that awakens the clitoris. Then you're stimulating clitoris. These are each orgasm places, littler orgasm, bigger orgasm, bigger orgasm to really surrender into each other. Then you put the penis inside the vagina, but only not even to the G-spot. G-spot's about an inch and a half in behind the clitoris. So you, first you wanna do the circling around, around the vagina. That's a very erotic zone for a woman. Once she's had a clitoris stimulation, there's literally all this uh, material in her body, which is like a man's penis, which if you rub around the circle, circle the vagina for a while, then do another position. See the whole idea in the ancient, if you look in Taoism and Tantra and India, Hinduism, they got all these positions. What they don't explain is that every time you have a position and every time a man sees ejaculation approaching, that's called the point of no return, which means he'll ejaculate. Before the point of no return, you're at a plateau. You notice you're at the plateau. When you notice the ejaculations coming, you stop. Quick, you just stop and change positions. Then you do another position and then you change positions. And each time you withdraw in a sense from giving her that stimulation, she wants more. You take it away from her. That actually causes her estrogen levels to rise, okay? <laughs> it's like, it actually, that causes her testosterone to balance her estrogen. Her estrogen is saying, this feels good, give me more, give me more. When she starts pulling too much, he'll wanna ejaculate, he needs to withdraw at that point, that will raise her testosterone and she will actually start having an, another orgasm every time he shifts to another position. So there's this in and out thing, the same dynamic of going in and out, you go in, but you come out fully and change to another position. And the whole time for a man, as you slowly go deeper inside, 
as you can last longer. Then you get up to the clitoris. I'm, I'm sorry, up to the G spot. And that's where you can change positions, which put more position, more pressure from your penis on her G spot, pushing in right at that spot. That's only an inch and a half in, and she's already had two or three orgasms. You've withdrawn maybe many, many times. And a guy is very soft or low testosterone. He needs to take a lot of time. He change position, change position, change position, till his energy builds up so that he can last. Because the deeper he goes, the more stimulation there is to his body and his body can't handle that much stimulation. It takes testosterone from him to handle that much pleasure because pleasure is estrogen. So if you just dive right in, you go, oh, give me, give me the gusto, you know, this feels great. Your estrogen just shoots up and estrogen pushes testosterone down and he's finished. So this is like control for men have to practice this control. And a lot of guys, they can feel it when they're in there and they're moving, they're going too deep and she's going, this is great. She's wanting it. And if she's wanting it at that point where she starts taking instead of being done to, she grabs it. And that's as women who masturbate a lot often are very good at grabbing. And then they get with a guy and he ejaculates very quickly because she has to keep learning how to let it go and allow him to take her to that place and not grab it. Because if she grabs, that means she's contracting, that prevents his energy from flowing into her and coming back out. So there's a- Yeah, place less of, of a receiving, more of a, yeah. It's right. a receiving and a receiving and a patience and allowing. Because often, particularly women are not confidently um, multi-orgasmic. When they see they can get to that place, oh, I need more, I need more, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. And they're grabbing, he'll usually be done at that point. That's when he needs to, and he can just watch his own body. He doesn't have to figure her out. He can just feel, if I'm getting close to the point of no return, pull out and pull out fast. You know, when I was younger, I would just try to stay in there and I just watch my energy, <laughs> my estrogen going higher and higher. And then I'd ejaculate, I have no control. So what you want to do is be able to go for a long period of time and keep withdrawing until then you can actually start having sex. And most of the time you never even ejaculate. You don't need to. You give up the deepest uh, addiction males have is the addiction to end, uh, ejac the end sex, basically. The and end then, result, yep. Every day your testosterone is so high because you didn't lower it. There's research out of Japan that shows a 25-year-old stud guy he has sex on Saturday night. The next day his testosterone's half and it will stay half for the whole week. And then on the seventh day of no ejaculating, it will double. Not ejaculating sex doubles. And then you get become alpha. And that's how you become real alpha man is your testosterone's double what normal guys are. And that's real alpha. And real alpha means great sex. And we're coming back to what you're saying. What keeps people together is great sex. Women will never lose a man. He will always want her. He doesn't think about other women if he's having great sex with you. I could care less about having sex with anybody because I have great sex with my partner. Why would I look anywhere else? And see, that's if you have it. And there's such a freedom. That's yeah. what monogamy can be. See, I don't have to see what men don't even realize how they're just throwing energy away, lusting after that woman, lusting after that woman. It's like just looking at the world and going, that's something I can't have. That's something I can't have. That's something I can get. Now all your energy goes to there as opposed to I got it. I got it whenever I want it. Every day I got it. But if you want it every day, you can't be ejaculating every day. That will cause a woman to lose interest in you. You see, what happens is there's a, a dynamic that when a woman climaxes, a man's testosterone, if he ejaculates, will always go down 50%. So that produces a conditioned response at a woman's body is that she loses him every time she opens up to him. See, the, the multi-orgasmic woman is, the, is what the French call orgasm, which is a little death or a big death. I'm dying, I'm dying, I can't take any more. I mean, it's a delightful experience for her and for the man, because the more she's taking it in, the more free he is from the dependence on releasing. He can last as long as, as she can take it. And that's delightful. And that becomes a little athletic sex. It doesn't always have to be that. I don't wanna be so goal oriented here as I'm talking. You know, if you, It can just be a 30 minute sex thing, that's fine. It could be 20 minutes, five minutes, hours. You know, there's, there's no right way except look at the science. The science shows that today women lose interest in sex. I spent my lifetime trying to understand this, figuring it out and achieving it. And one of it, of course, she has to feel safe. That keeps her estrogen up. 
That's all the relationship skills outside the bedroom. But the next thing, she has to enjoy sex more than him. Okay? You will never lose a man. You'll never lose the attraction if you enjoy sex more than him. But here's one of the things that keeps her. One is a man who doesn't have the sexual skills because he hasn't learned about this stuff. I do have a book called Mars Venus in a Bedroom, which is the basics. But when he, when he orgasms with her, he ejaculates. If he ejaculates, now his testosterone goes down. She with, he withdraws. That's a conditioned response in her unconscious mind. You see, the most conditioned part of us is the unconscious part of us. That's conditioning. Sex is completely unconscious. You cannot control it. It's all conditioned. So we are automatically sexual beings, but we become unsexual. One of the reasons is women feel safe, they open up, and a man pulls away. He has to come back. Now I'm gonna do a metaphor for that and then explain more sexually. At 23 years in my marriage, my wife told me, I asked her for a rating on me as a husband. And, <laughs> How brave of you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. She said, John, as a father, you're A plus for our children. You're the best father I could ever imagine. As a husband, you're not perfect, but you've given me the greatest gift any woman could want. I said, what's that? She said, I know that if I get upset with you or I get upset or I do things that you don't like, you can get upset. But every time you get upset, you go to your cave and you always come back with more love, always. And so I know there's nothing I could say or do that ever push you out of my life. And that is security, that's okay. safety. And it's that safety and security that allowed her to love sex with me. And, and it's also why a lot of people challenge, like the women are constantly challenging. I think it's a primal thing when they start to feel that they're not safe, they'll challenge it to hope that they're going to come around. Meanwhile, the guy's like, what the hell is going on here? That's exactly it. It's called testing. It's testing. Right. You don't get that women test all the time. Right. It's a need for reassurance. Yes. We men, women will call it an ego trip and men, like we do stuff and we want somebody to go, hey, good job. Wow, what a great idea. Or we're looking for reassurance that we're competent and capable in your eyes, that you trust us and so forth. And women are looking for reassurance all the time that they're safe and they're safe. And sometimes they'll say stuff and do stuff just to test. And it's unconscious. A lot of this is unconscious. So now let's look at unconscious conditioning. What happens to women is high estrogen levels, man pulls away, that means he left at that time. And so what happens is there's a conditioned response that if I fully open, I lose him. So I think I'm if I'm vulnerable, it's a problem. That's what we would think, yeah. Yeah, the way you would put it, it being vulnerable, I lose him. So I can't be that vulnerable. And literally the body begins to close down from being so open with him. But it's good sexual practice. And this is a study in Japan that showed that when the man has his orgasm one day a week, then his testosterone builds up to where on the seventh day of not ejaculating, six days of no ejaculating, then on the seventh day, he wakes up and he has twice the testosterone, which is like an example of me coming out of the cave with more love. And that then reestablishes the reassurance that, yeah, it goes away, but it comes back and she can continue to open up. And now, so are you talking about um, when you say that as like the once a week and the buildup, are you talking about completely refraining from self-pleasure or sex, or you're talking about non-ejaculatory sex? I mean, clarify that because that yeah, sounds, very, you know, because I would devil's advocate be like, why would you, why would you limit my sex to once or twice a week, John? I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. What happens for couples that have a lot of, first, let me just explain what I'm saying is if a man ejaculates once a week, he will have twice the testosterone at least once a once once a week. And that's very important for a woman. Now, if he's like has sex with his wife on Saturday night, and this is very common in America, but then he goes and he masturbates on Tuesday watching porn, he never hits that double level again in his life. And she will lose interest and he will lose interest. Just masturbation once a week, other than sex, over time, you will start having lower and lower testosterone. And that's tested. Okay, that's just straight biology. Now, I think for men who will get older, according to the Asian Taoist philosophy, it's not just seven days before it doubles, it's eight days, and then it's nine days, and it's 10 days. And, you know, if you want to live to, you know, 100 or 200, you know, according to their system, you give it up completely, and you have sex almost every day, but you don't ejaculate. That's where I am. I'm 69 years old. I've got the testosterone levels twice every day of what I had when I was a young man. And it's because I don't ejaculate at all. I can be multi-orgasmic. I enjoy sex every day or every other day, depending on circumstances. Mm -hmm. 
and I don't ejaculate and she has orgasms to the end of the kazoo. She can have as many orgasms as long as she has somebody doing it to her. She will always be, she will not become depleted. Okay. Because she feels loved. See, she has to feel loved. You see a lot of women who are paid tantric goddesses who do this thing. Uh, you know, it's the nicer way of looking at a prostitute. Uh, they become dry and they become depleted. They don't shine and they don't, I watched them, you know, I didn't know. I, I, I know that the Taoism says that, you know, women can have as many orgasms as, 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 as they can. It's not going to deplete them of energy as long as somebody's doing it to them. And the person who's doing it to them is doing it out of love. And also in their system, he's not ejaculating every time. See, that's the whole thing. So if you don't want to give up your ejaculations in sex or have less ejaculations in sex, then have less sex. But the key to this thing is our teenagers, our 20-year-olds are all up to 30, 35 years old. The testosterone levels are so much lower than in my generation. And that's proven as well. What happened? Well, there's the father dynamic. They're not around their fathers. That's one aspect. But the other one, which is also why they're addicted to porn, Porn is available. Porn is like co cocaine. We don't have a knowledge, a, a knowledge set. What is this doing to males? It depletes them massively of testosterone. Now, what that means is that a low testosterone man can always be turned on to a new and different woman, a new and different woman, an impersonal relationship. But once it becomes a personal relationship and he's familiar with her, that means he feels intimacy, estrogen, he feels oxytocin, he feels safe with her, he feels optimistic with her, he's producing serotonin. Suddenly those hormones uh, lower his testosterone dramatically. And so he can't be turned on to her. So the low testosterone man can go to a woman online where there's uh, newness, newness, novel, newness, different, unusual, out of the ordinary, dangerous, any of those types of things stimulate dopamine, which temporarily raises his testosterone and leaves it lower than before, where he's now dependent on more, more dopamine, which lowers it. And it's usually about eight minutes. That's a, the average time a man goes online, within eight minutes he's done. And he just threw away his life force. He doesn't understand what's happening and he's addicted to it, just like a heroin or cocaine addict. And it inhibits his ability to stay turned on to his partner who he loves. Because all it takes is for on, on, on the scale of averages, and these are statistics, on averages, a man gets married, his testosterone levels drop. Why? Because now he has estrogen production more of the time because he loves her. See, if he's alone, his testosterone will build up. Independence creates testosterone. Now, suddenly, I'm living with you. I'm dependent on, well, how are your feelings? What do you care? Do you approve of me? Do you appreciate me? I feel more on my female side. That's going to lower my testosterone, which is why men need to back off from caring about you and doing what I want to do. Don't tell me what to do. I'm going off. And you know, you, you talked about women emasculating men. They'll just say anything to a man and how do, you, how do you not let her emasculate you? That's the very thing, because most people hear that, they go, well, he should get mad at her. Actually, that's the worst thing he should do. You don't get mad at a woman who's emasculating you, putting you down. You basically stop listening to her. You say, all right, I hear what you're saying. I'll think about it and walk away. You walk away. I'll think about it. I'll walk away. Don't engage the conversation. Don't argue with her. You don't have to prove yourself to her. You don't have to. You already deserve her love. That She's having a bad day. That's her issue. And she just learns. If I talk like this, he walks away. He walks away. He That's doesn't crazy. yell at you. He basically just goes, you know, and you could say, you know, I don't like to be talked to like that. But even that can hurt some women's feelings. Instead, you just say, you know, I'll think about that and then walk away. That's it. And... <laughs> It's the same way, the way I tell women, if you, want to, if you want to train a man, it's the same thing. If you, minimize, if you minimize what he's doing, he will actually hear you better. In this case, man, if you want her to stop what she's doing, don't engage her. Don't make her wrong. Just, you know, I'll need to think about that. I hear you. And even better, well, help me understand why you feel that way. Try to bring it to the emotion. See, this is, if you're a little more skilled, one is just walk away, don't engage, that's it. You just know he's gonna walk away, why bother? And my wife trained me doing the same thing, which is, I used to, well, you can see I can talk forever. 
and I'm famous. So when I go to a party, everybody wants to talk to me. And so I suddenly have a seminar. Wherever I go, there's a group of people that will gather around. These are interesting things, you know, in all subjects. So, uh, you know, she says, John, in social settings, we need to let other people talk. You know, it's, it, it's conversation. It's back and forth. You have to learn that. I said, okay, I'll try, but I would just get into my mode. So all she would do, and she trained me quite well, she would just smile. Oh, he's doing it. And then go into another room. That was it. And so I went, oh, okay, I'll, I'll adjust. You know, I'll go, I want to include my wife more than these other people. So it's, it's the feather touch. It's not trying to change your partner, but letting them know that, you know, this doesn't work for me and just walking out of the room. Oh, this is so much good stuff. So I would ask this too then. So, okay, aside from underlying health issues with either male or female in a couple or a marriage or situation, if, you know, you know what happens like you know you you I hear the story right you get married the guy gets married they were sexual and then all of a sudden they stop getting blowjobs jobs and they're like man i don't feel like it anymore or i'm just not into it anymore and you're like wait what hold on that was ha- now you're taking that away or they're just not into it what what's a guy to do to bring up this topic because that can be contentious too by being like i need more sex or you how how do we bring this conversation up between couples who are struggling with this either male or female to to it's usually the male to female i would assume would be your experience it's common but at 35 is a woman's sexual prime generally speaking as a shift that happens at 21 28 35 42 49 all of these are different shifts that take place 7 years old 14 years old puberty 21 years old that you're an adult 28 years old you get divorced 35 years old, women's sexual prime, 42 years old, midlife crisis, 49 years old, depression, you didn't make it in life. (laughs) (laughs) Six years old, you die of a heart attack. You know, this is a a lot of common experiences that people have. They're they're natural cycles of shift. Okay, so uh, women tell me all the time when I point out what you just said, which is, you know, often men want more sex than the woman. But actually, women love sex. They just have to get into the frame of mind where they can feel safe enough to want it just as much as a man. So theoretically, but I want to talk about the flip side of this. If a woman is saying to her husband, let's have sex, and he's not in the mood, uh, his testosterone will massively drop. I mean, massively drop. It's, I, at one point, my wife at 35 was wanting more sex than I wanted. And every time she said she wanted more sex, so let's have sex. I said, no, I'm tired. Or really? We haven't had sex in a few days. You know, I would just feel like a brick hit me. Okay, stress, because, right? Was that? Like the stress lowered your testosterone is what well, you're saying? We usually think of stress as kind of an agitation. It, w- it was literally her wanting and I couldn't provide. Ah, yeah. And, and the way I experienced it was a sudden drop in energy. I mean, literally like a, there was nothing. Because see, you can't control that part of you. And so whenever a man feels powerless testosterone goes down. Whenever you feel powerful, testosterone goes up. See, confidence, I can provide for you what you need. So it's a delicate thing if your woman's wanting more sex than a man, how to approach that. So one thing for the women who hit their prime and their husbands, for whatever reason, he's out of work, he's an alcoholic, he's addicted to masturbation, he's not interested in sex with you because you're too bitchy, you know, any of those kinds of things to lower his testosterone. So it could be a wide range of things. And you're just saying, I want sex. There could be exceptions to this, but generally when women say I want sex, often, well, no, this would be when they're in their 48, 49, they're saying, gee, I want to have sex. Their body is not saying I want to have sex. Their mind is saying, I want to have those feelings I used to have with you, but they're really not hitting their estrogen peak where they're saying I want sex. But at 35 years old, she does want sex, okay? Her body is saying, I'm missing it. And for whatever these reasons are, he doesn't have the testosterone. How to introduce that? You wouldn't want to just say to him, let's have sex, if you have a sense that you're not having enough sex. Because that's already a put down. You know, if you're having regular sex, hey, let's have sex. And, you know, but it hasn't been happening for a while. Why aren't we having sex? Let's have sex. Boom. Pressure on the man and no erection. I mean, literally. Once that happened to me, it was scary as could be. You know, this is my old friend always comes up when, when it's just like, it, it was traumatizing to be quite honest. Okay, so now, okay. so th- these are some nice techniques. One is the, the candle technique, and this works back for male or female. Two different candles and a, a little candle. Her candle, she lights her candle, she's in the mood, no pressure, but just knowing she's in the mood, but no pressure could be tomorrow, could be the next day, but 
because men don't know when you're in the mood. We don't know. And so the candle lights, we know you're in the mood. Then we feel this confidence that if and when I initiate sex, I will get a yes. Right. One of the things that we unknowingly know that dampens a man's sexual desire is a woman's rejection. Okay, this is a this is a part of us that has no brain. It just says, I want to have sex. And she says, well, I still have to make fruit salad for lunch for our friends who are coming over. <laughs> but dang, who da, whatever they are, you know, making that more important than me. You know, so this because this is a big me down here. So <laughs> so it's it just these rejections that happen suddenly after you know a few years of being rejected many times, a man comes home, he's looking, is she in the mood? Is she not in the mood? He doesn't want to alter. But actually, sometimes just a little conversation about sex can put a woman in the mood if she's not in the mood. And he doesn't know that. You know, I learned this technique along. In the beginning of my marriage, it was so helpful. I'd say, honey, you want to have sex? She'd say, oh, no, I'm so busy. And I'd say, is there a part of you that wants to have sex? And she'd always say, oh, of course, there's a part of me that wants to have sex. I still have to do this and this. And I said, well, tell me what you have to do. And then she'd talk a little bit. And if I get her to talk without trying to solve anything, estrogen levels go up and that can awaken sexual desire. Because you're expressing interest and you're asking, you know, you're, you're attentive yes. to her in that moment. That makes total sense based on what you've said. So, yeah. so, but the man needs to have that confidence. It, it, so it's just learning that one phrase. It just saved us. I said, well, is there a part of you that wants to have sex? She says, well, there's always a part of me that wants to have sex with you, John. You're amazing. Said, okay, well, tell me why you don't. You know, she would talk a little bit and then she says, all right, we can have sex. It was, or we could say, and we could do it tomorrow, but I didn't feel any rejection, particularly because there's a part of it that wants to have sex. That's something men really need to hear for their sense of sex drive. And so you have a candle when she's in the mood, she's gonna light it, which means no pressure whenever, but you'll get a big yes from me. He lights his candle, which says he's interested in sex, no pressure, but when you're in the mood or when you're interested, then light your candle and then both candles are lit, then he's free to then initiate sex or she's free to initiate sex. You have this sort of freedom that you felt in the beginning of the relationship when there was newness, which stimulated plenty of dopamine and dopamine increases high estrogen for women and high testosterone for men. So that's why we're so sexually compatible in the beginning is the newness. But when newness goes away, that's where we have to have good relationship skills that nurture estrogen in her and testosterone in him. And Typically speaking, our relationship skills we have today tend to push men over to their female side and women over to their male side. They become that mothering influence, taking care of him. He comes home and sits and watches TV and does, drinks beer and all these things. His estrogen goes up and she's caretaking him until she resents him and they get a divorce. Yeah. But I will say back to your original premise, I've been counseling over 40 years. I've never counseled a couple except a few cases where a couple was having great, both were having great sex and they wanted a divorce. Of and, course, it, it, and, and that goes back, do we know what the statistics is on the percentage of sex being important? I would say it's like you said, it's the most important. Or uh, it, It's hard to know the percentage of that, except talk to somebody who's been doing this for 40 years. I've never, okay. it, we, it's, think about it. I mean, what you said right away, I'm just repeating what you said. Why do we pick our partner? Because it's sex. You don't just pick any man. You pick a man who's safe, secure, but also there's sex. Sex is what makes it different from everything else. Sexual energy with love is the most powerful orgasmic experience there is. Sex alone is boring. I mean, I can't even think about it. But sex with a stranger to me is like, like puppets, you know? It's, a, yep. it's nothing. But to have real love of a merging of souls that grows over time and years and years of that, nothing can replace that. You know, somebody said, you can't just make a friend right away. It takes a lifetime to make a, you can't replace an old friend. That's the phrase I want to say. And you certainly can't have that experience of such safety and yet also such desire at yeah. the same time. And that, that's, that's irreplaceable. And that's an option for people. And that's why sex is so fantastic. We all need to understand it. And at the same time, I want to back off for a moment and let you know there's many couples who are very content and very happy with their grandchildren and their children and their lives. And that they're happy with that. Okay. They're, they're, that's fine. We're not saying everybody has to have sex, but we're saying that there are many, many people. And I think it's more and more people in this new world where we want it. We want it all. And if we stop having sex, then problems start happening. And, and, but when there's big problems in relationship, there's no sex, but there can also be no sex and no problems. And people get old and die at 72 and 80, you know, and they just kind of fade into the background content. 
kind of like the old generation. And still some people, that's okay with them. But you, me, to people listening to this podcast, we want to have great sex. And when the sex goes away, it usually goes away within the first six months for a lot of couples who are dating and whatever, and they lose interest. They move on. They say, we're still friends. We're just moving on. And it's because they didn't have the polarity skills because this gender neutral society we're in, uh, it's, it no bueno. us, we lose the primal polarity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the most important. Uh, so, gosh, I hope to get trapped in a room at a party with you someday. So I can, <laughs> with your wife in the other room, so I could just hear your sermon. Thank you so much. We're going to put everything to connect in the show notes, but let us know how we, first of all, do you still work with couples and uh, one-on-one with people? Just in my classes. I do some with uh, on Facebook live now because uh, I'm in quarantine, but generally speaking, I, d- I don't do couples anymore or individuals because I, I travel to 20 countries around the world. At least I used to. Uh, the big audiences, you know, here in Mill Valley, I have like 50 people in a class where I live, <laughs> but around the world, I get thousands of people. It's always you're more acknowledged outside. The further away you go, the more popular you are. Uh, yeah. But, but so also, tell, us, tell us your website and so how we can okay. connect you and look into all the ways we can be helped by you. Okay, so all the ways. John Gray, Mars, Venus, Facebook. I just finished 70 hours of, of personal development training on meditation, communication skills, uh, uh, healing the heart, you know, dealing with your past issues, uh, making your dreams come true, success principles, and sex, and dating, and romance. So those categories, there's over 70 hours of material which is sitting on my wow. Facebook site that I just finished. So anybody can go there, it's still free. It might be one of those things you pay for someday, but right now it's free. So people could go there. They can go to 100 hours of 100 different blogs I have on relationships at uh, marsvenus.com. So marsvenus.com has that, and that's free. Right there on the front page is a free three-day class with me that I do with my daughter, Lauren. She's 34. She teaches this stuff better than me. So she does the whole thing, the workbook, and the whole thing goes with it, and it's free for people. I have an insider's club, which is every day you have access to a two-hour seminar with me <laughs> based upon the theme of that day, and it's a whole year, whole year program. You can do that, and that's more structured in terms of your goals and what you want. So there's a lot of stuff available. Then there's also a health food store there. Uh, we call it our wellness store, where I have uh, you know, 32 different blogs on natural remedies for the normal types of challenges people have, sleep, depression, anxiety, uh, libido, hormonal balance, blood sugar issues. You know, these are pain, energy. These are simple things, simple things. They're not diseases. This is normal life. And I'm a student of different cultures using adaptogens and nutrition and vitamins and certain exercises in order to normalize blood pressure, balance blood blood sugar, better sleep. And that's all in there too. So you've got a whole wealth of information. There's a three, 500 page book you can download called Wellness, My Wellness Solutions. And then there's my 24 books you can order through Amazon. So, thank, so. You know what? Th- thank you so much for making so much of your material free. It's just such an, it's so wonderful in this day and age to be able to access that where someone can just g- get a little bit of peace of mind by just turning on, you know, going to your Facebook group or, or whatnot. And thank you so much for all of your work. Gosh, we'll ha- hopefully we'll have you back on again. I know this is just going to be oh, such a popular I'll, episode. I'll love to talk to you anytime. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.